It's spring on the calendar, but old man winter makes a late appearance in Thunder Bay. Good evening and thank you for joining us. Love it or hate it, winter weather has finally arrived almost a week into spring. More than 15 centimeters of snow have fallen in the last 24 hours, and it's not letting up just yet. Lee Noonan has more on the March snowstorm, and Lee, it's made quite a mess out there. Yeah, uh, snow plows and shovels might not have seen much use this winter, but they were out in force today. The snowfall closed rural schools and bus routes, and it's keeping city roads division workers very busy. Thunder Bay is no stranger to a spring snowstorm, and after a very mild winter, the city is seeing one of its biggest snowstorms of the year, now in late March. Snow plows, salters and graders spent an unusual amount of time idle this year, but they're all out dealing with the current snowfall. It's all hands on deck and everyone's out there uh, trying to get those roads cleared and sidewalks cleared as fast as possible. Roads Division Manager Ian Spaljerich says the heavy snowfall means long hours for their crews. They usually come in at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. depending on what piece of equipment they are uh, and then they'll work till about 4.30 p.m. today, go home get some rest and be back tomorrow morning if needed. Plows are focused on keeping main routes cleared and won't get to residential streets until there's a break in the snowfall. That could mean some residents don't see their streets plowed for a few days, depending on how much more snow comes. City residents were out with their shovels right away, and the people we spoke with don't seem too bothered by the snow. We've been expecting it since last fall. <laughs> <laughs> finally, got it. finally got it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, we always get one in you know, March, April, so not too too surprised by it. Good thing we still have the snow blower out. Been working, yeah. Barely working. <laughs> we need the snow anyways because the ground is so dry and uh, get good to get a little moisture in it. I don't mind cleaning up a little bit of snow. It's going to all go away anyway, so it's okay. I don't mind it either. I'm, quite, I'm glad it's more this than it was when we first moved here. We got an ice storm and the vehicle was covered with like almost four inches of ice. So I'm glad it was snow. <laughs> Lee Noonan. TBT News. A lot of positive attitudes there. Let's bring in Fiona Gardner now to tell us a little bit more about this, Fiona. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that over the last 24 hours, I've shoveled more than I did all winter. I, I think that's the case for the majority <laughs> of folks out there. If we take a look at the system itself, you can see it's coming up from the southwest. It's got a lot of moisture and started last night around dinner time for the most part. It's pushed through overnight, and then during the day, we've had a few pockets of drier uh, conditions, so we did have a few breaks during the day. But as you can see, there's a whole lot more to move out of the region starting tonight and tomorrow. So no surprise, we have winter storm warnings and snowfall warnings and the like through most of northwestern Ontario. And that's going to last into Tuesday night. Um, some areas could see 25 centimeters when all is said and done. Others could be up to 50 centimeters. And I'll have more details on what that's done to uh, different locations in the region. That'll be later on in the news hour. Okay, thanks a lot, Fiona. Thunder Bay Police have now confirmed that yesterday's standoff in a Northside neighborhood happened after a shooting. Emergency task unit officers were called to the Trillium Court area around 4 o'clock Sunday afternoon for an incident involving a weapon. A male victim was found with serious injuries and was transported to hospital. The OPP was also on the scene. The City Police Force's Major Crimes Unit is now leading the investigation. There's no word on what led to the shooting or if an arrest has been made. A police presence remained at the scene today. Police are asking anyone in the area with home surveillance or dash camera footage from 4.15 to 4.45 p.m. yesterday to contact investigators. The number of violent incidents at Thunder Bay Regional has dropped significantly since city police officers were brought in to help security staff back in 2022. The hospital pays police, police to be there, but given a lack of available officers and increased overtime costs, the police service hopes to find alternative ways to make the hospital safer. Between April 2023 and February 2024, there were 16 reported assaults against emergency department workers. That's less than half than over the same period a year earlier. Police Chief Darcy Fleury still wants to support the hospital, but feels the current arrangement is causing issues for the service. We have the two officers there regularly. 
on, on the on the schedule that they're on. Can we look at other can we look at other um, ways to provide that service outside of regular officers and hopefully get them back to do other duties? For example, if we're short on a watch and we have people working at the hospital, um, we have to call somebody in overtime. So we're, the hospital is being covered, but we have to call people in overtime. A hospital spokesperson previously said paying for police at the facility costs up to $60,000 a month. The current contract is up soon. Hospital officials and city police will discuss whether the arrangement should continue. A proposal to increase the municipal accommodation tax is up for discussion at tonight's city council meeting. The surcharge on local hotel and motel stays currently sits at 4%. Around $12.3 million in revenue has been collected since the hotel tax was first implemented in 2018. The money is distributed equally between the city and the Community Economic Development Commission in order to support local tourism initiatives. Councillor Casey Atraney brought forward the idea of increasing the surcharge, saying it will benefit the city. It could be a big impact, and we have to remember what those dollars go to. So Matt goes to tourism. Tourism, what does tourism do for our community? It's of huge economic value. And so I just don't see this harming that economic value, but actually bringing more money into our community. So I think it's just a time for us to, post COVID, for us to take a look at our MAT tax and potentially see an increase. If council approves the idea, city staff will first look at what increasing the hotel tax would mean for all stakeholders. A current measure aimed at providing gas tax relief for Ontarians will continue. We got that word from Premier Doug Ford today. CTV's Siobhan Morris explains. The end of the road has been moved for what was supposed to be a temporary break at the pumps. We're going to extend the gas tax cut through to December 31st, 2024. That cut off more than five cents a litre for both gasoline and diesel. It was due to expire at the end of June after several renewals. It's never been more important to keep costs down especially now as people struggle with the Bank of Canada's interest rate hikes and the rising cost of the federal carbon tax. A tax scheduled to jump on April 1st, adding about three cents to a litre of gas, among other things. The Premier wants the feds to pump the brakes. I urge you to immediately scrap next week's tax hike. The federal environment minister counters most Canadians get back more in rebates than they pay into the carbon tax. Oh, these look great. The finance minister choosing steel-toed work boots to fulfill the tradition of buying a new pair of shoes before delivering a budget. My provincial credit card has a couple hundred billion. This one a little less. <laughs> Peter Bethlen Falvey says his spending plan will fit that building theme while keeping costs down. It's going to help us stay the course while creating stronger communities, not just for today, but for tomorrow as well. The opposition wants a budget that puts people first. Meaningful investment in public health care, in public education, in real bold housing solutions that are going to deliver a truly affordable, supportive, attainable housing. With more measures to improve affordability. Removing the provincial portion of uh, home tax on home heating. That can be removing the provincial portion of tax on OSAP loans. The Greens figure if the government really wanted to make driving more affordable. They would make electric vehicles more affordable for drivers. It costs one tenth to fill up an electric vehicle versus a gas engine. Especially as Ontario invests in the EV supply chain. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. OPP around the region dealt with snowy conditions and several highway closures this weekend. There were also a pair of frightening collisions, both east and west of Thunder Bay. This pickup truck wound up on its roof after colliding with a moose early Sunday morning on Highway 17 near Marathon, east of the Steel River Bridge. The driver of the vehicle was taken to Marathon Hospital with minor injuries. And Dryden OPP were called to a single vehicle crash on Highway 665 this weekend. The car went off the highway, struck a hydro pole, and rolled several times. Police say the driver was very fortunate to only sustain minor injuries. There were subsequently arrested for impaired driving after blowing over twice the legal limit. Kenora's Conservative MP Eric Melillo is calling on Thunder Bay Rainy River MP Marcus Pulowski to be, quote, sensible and oppose the Trudeau government's carbon pricing policy. But Pulowski suggests it's the Conservatives who are showing a lack of common sense. Melillo held a news conference this morning in front of Pulowski's Thunder Bay office. 
He wants the Liberal MP to break ranks with his party and support Conservative efforts to cut the federal carbon tax, which is scheduled to increase on April 1st. Melillo connects the carbon tax to the increasing cost of living that many in the region are struggling with. There's been some heartbreaking stories people have been sharing, and I've been hearing uh, not just from people in my backyard in Kenora, but from the Rainy River District, from Mr. Polevsky's riding, uh, reaching out to me and, and, and sharing those stories as well. So again, that's why we're here calling on him and, and, and on all uh, the NDP and Liberal members across Northern Ontario to, to join us in our call to, to stop this carbon tax hike. I, I'm going to stand up for the interests of the people of my riding. People keep saying, like, you're not standing up for the peop people of my riding. Yes, I am. I'm standing up for them, but I'm standing up for their kids who are in school, who don't vote, and their grandchildren because it's in their best interest that we fight climate change. It's in their best financial interest that we put our money in now and we do what is required now in order to affect climate change. Polowski says the Conservatives are ignoring the high price of, of climate change with billions of dollars spent to deal with flooding, forest fires and storms across the country. He says the idea that the carbon tax is to blame for the increased cost of living is, quote, baloney. The Port of Thunder Bay celebrated the start of shipping season yesterday with a top hat ceremony for the captain of the MV Harvest Spirit. The ship made its way into port Saturday evening and officials say this is one of the earliest openings the port has ever had. Jessica Clement reports. Thunder Bay's shipping season started a little early this year with the Harvest Spirit arriving in port at around 5.40 Saturday evening. The cargo vessel docked at the Richardson Port Terminal to take three cargo holds of canola and one of soybeans. With cargo loading operations underway, a top hat ceremony was held Sunday morning with the ship's captain, Adam Hagen. This is the second year in a row Captain Hagen was bestowed the ceremonial top hat. He says he's glad to honor the tradition again. I was a deckhand uh, looking down off the ship a couple times when, when some of my captains uh, uh, would, get, would get the honor. And so to finally get it, it's, it's funny. Um, again, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a traditionalist. I, I, love, I, lo I love listening to the old guys and, and the stories and so on. So now to be able to, to be in this position, it's, it's an honor. I, I, love, uh, I love the tradition. The Harvest Spirit is a regular sight in the port of Thunder Bay, and Captain Hagen expects to make around 26 trips for grain this year. He says Thunder Bay is their most important port of call. Putting, putting grain through the Great Lakes not only adds to the tradition of uh, you know, over 100 years of, uh, of shipping, but also uh, it's a great economic engine. According to Port Authority CEO Chris Hakenen, the arrival of the Harvest Spirit ties the record for the earliest port openings. He says he's expecting a positive shipping season this year. I've had a look at the, the first slate of vessels that are due to arrive over the next several weeks, and it's really strong uh, compared to other seasons, you know, at least for the start. Um, it'll be, you know, it always remains to be seen. Uh, how things like the grain harvest uh, play out over the year. You, you can't really predict that, but uh, so far things are looking strong. Hakenen adds that the port is expecting the first ocean-going ship to arrive sometime later this week. Jessica Clement, TVT News. It was a very memorable Juno Awards weekend for Asa Nabi. The singer-songwriter from the Thunder Bay area won two Junos and performed a tribute to a pair of Canadian music legends. And I could never be set free as long as I'm a ghost you can see. Asanabi performed with other artists last night in honor of Gordon Lightfoot and Robbie Robertson, who both passed away over the past year. The member of Sandy Lake First Nation grew up in Kaministiqua and went to school in Thunder Bay. He was nominated for three Junos, winning two of them during a non-televised event on Saturday night. He took home trophies for Songwriter of the Year and for Alternative Album of the Year for his latest release, Here and Now. I grew up in a, in a trailer in northern Ontario without electricity and running water, and now I'm here. Uh, for those that know me know that I don't write speeches. I wrote a speech but there's not time for it, so you don't get it. Hey, Sanabe did end up having enough time to thank his Indigenous-owned record label, his booking agent, music producers, and others who've supported him along his journey.
The dummies were skiing, sliding, flying, and tumbling down the hill at Loch Lomond yesterday for the ski area's annual Dummy Downhill. The fan-favorite event saw eight dummies of varying shapes and sizes tackle the big hill known as the Giant. Despite the lack of snow throughout the winter, the event was still a smashing success as hundreds of people came out to cheer on their favorite dummy. This year's winner was Shreddy Teddy, who caught big air off the jump and garnered the loudest cheers from the audience. Loch Lomond President Jason Gary says they don't have a specific method when determining the winner of the Dummy Downhill. So the Dummy Downhill is, uh, is loosely based in competition. Um, we don't really have any rules per se. Uh, it's mostly just done by arbitrary assignment of points based off of uh, the amount of carnage or how far they make it down the hill or uh, the excitement that they create in, uh, in their attempt at fame. Gary adds they were originally going to close the ski hill after this weekend, but with the snow that started falling right after the dummy downhill, they say they're now looking to stay open for Easter long weekend. Updates can be found on Loch Lomond's website and social media pages. That seems like a good way to judge that contest. No real rules, just strictly off of gut feel. Oh, and I, I think they made the right call. <laughs> Absolutely. I think so, too. All right, Fiona, you already told us about uh, the big winter storm that we are experiencing. But what else do we have in store? Well, today we've already heard about the snow. The temperatures, what I've noticed, is not really moving much. With this snow has come... Uh, very consistent temperatures. We had a low of minus 2, although wind chills did feel close to minus 8, but a low of minus 2, daytime high of 0. That's a difference of just 2 degrees, and that's despite some pretty strong winds, 21 to 47 kilometers per hour. It's actually going to go up from there, and we're not the only ones that experienced not a lot of movement in temperatures. Now, up towards Red Lake, it has stayed fairly dry thus far. They're currently at minus 7, which is their high for the day. They started out at minus 17, but at this hour, good 10 degrees warmer, although ironically with the wind chill, it feels about 8 degrees cooler. If that makes sense. However, through this portion of the region where all the snow has been pushing up from the southwest, temperatures really haven't moved much. Fort Francis had a low of minus 6, a high of minus 5. Similar in Dryden, Uppsala, Armstrong, Greenstone is currently at, currently at their high of minus 4. They had an overnight low of just minus 6. And as you can see, consistent snow throughout the day. Sioux St. Marie and Wawa staying a little bit warmer. In fact, the Sioux is staying on the plus side at 5 Celsius under mostly cloudy skies, which is actually quite seasonal for this time of year. Now, for the city of Thunder Bay tonight, we are going to barely move overnight. A low of minus 3, so dropping about 3 degrees from where we're at. Wind chills feeling like minus 10. And the temperatures are going to stay pretty steady around minus 3 for most of the night. However, with it comes anywhere from 10 to 15 centimeters of snow and winds gusting from the northeast up to 60 kilometers per hour. So while the temperatures may not move much, the wind chills, that may be a different story. But with all that snow potential, it may just be too messy to go outside anyway. <laughs> yeah, I certainly won't be uh, venturing out tonight, I think. Somehow like... that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I know. Mm. I know. I, was, I, I thought about it. You know, <laughs> go out and... for, for a second. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Fiona. Let's turn our attention to international news now. The UN Security Council has passed a resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. This after the U.S. chose not to use its veto power and instead abstained from the vote. This, of course, has angered Israel. We'll have all those details and more when your Monday News Hour continues after the break. The Security Council resolution, which is the first of its kind to pass at the UN since the war began, demands a ceasefire in Gaza during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. 